on today's podcast. We just take the difference between nutrition and drugs. Almost all the drugs that are used in conventional medicine are basically like biological straitjackets. Mm -hmm. Their purpose is to downregulate or diminish or control some function in the body that has gotten out of control. But none of those functions exist for the purpose of going out of control and making you sick. They all exist to help you balance the way that you respond to different kinds of stress. So if the only tool you have is a straitjacket, you're going to get side effects that come out of, of the straitjacket effect. If you're a healthcare provider tired of just treating symptoms and ready to dig deeper into the root causes of health issues, the Vibrant Wellness Podcast is for you. With insider tips, expert interviews, and the latest in biotech research, this podcast will take your patient care to the next level. Welcome to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Jen Rivas, along with my esteemed colleague, Dr. Emmy Brown. And today we have a medical maverick and true pioneer in our midst. Dr. Leo Gallen, the wizard of unraveling complex chronic disorders, is here to share his secrets to a healthy, happier you. Dr. Emmy, are you ready to do some deep diving into intestinal microbes, infectious disorders, nutrition and autoimmunity, and so much more? I'm ready. Let's do this. <laughs> awesome. Well, Dr. Gallen's groundbreaking work on the gut microbiome has earned him international recognition, and his innovative nutritional therapies are rewriting the script on autoimmune, inflammatory, and gastrointestinal disorders. He's authored several best-selling books, and teaser alert, Dr. Gallen was even asked to write a section on functional foods for the encyclopedia. That is Amazing. I can't wait to talk about that. So buckle up. We're about to explore this fascinating world and how you can hopefully implement some of these pearls of wisdom into your own practice. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Gallen. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gallen. So I'm going to kick it off today. And before we transition to gastrointestinal health, which is really at the center of so much as we, we'll see moving forward. And we'll talk about the microbiome, of course. I'd like to point out a profound concept you speak to in one of your presentations. And I was really struck by this. And I think that it's, it's a good reminder for folks practicing functional medicine. And that is, you said, disease is what the doctor sees and illness is what the patient experiences. I think this clearly illustrates the divide between conventional practice and more holistic patient-centered care that you advocate for. So how and why did you become interested in a more integrative approach to practice after years of prestigious medical training and, and academia? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's because I'm kind of a perfectionist. Yeah. And so I recognized that what I had been trained to do when I had been trained well didn't always work very well especially when you get out of the medical center and you're in the community and you're dealing with people in the court, just regular people in the course of their lives. And that is, that's been documented, that conventional medicine is una unable to help a lot of people with chronic problems. And so I, I realized there has to be more to this than what I've been trained to do. And, and I realized that there was a great deal more. And it wasn't flaky stuff. It was information about patients that, hit, that really was grounded in science. That science just hadn't crossed over. And I'm talking about things like nutrition, environmental health, uh, behavioral medicine. Uh, and, uh, and so I started studying those areas to supplement what I had learned during my conventional training. And it was so helpful in getting people out of the place they were stuck to the next level of, of health that I realized I can never go backward and forget about this, that this actually, this should be the foundation. And when this isn't enough, that's when conventional medicine might be helpful. Uh, and of course, there have been I mean, I would started going down this path over 40 years ago. And there have been a lot of there have been a lot of changes in awareness since then. I can't say that the practice of medicine 
has changed very much. Whenever I go into a hospital or get involved with the conventional healthcare system, I realize that itself hasn't changed very much, but the awareness of its limitations and the need for a more holistic and integrative approach has definitely changed. Patients are demanding it, I feel, yes. more and more. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. People are advocating, I feel like, for their health a lot more than, you know, 10 years ago or, or longer. That's great. Now, on your website, Dr. Gallen, you point out the three principles that ground your practice. Now, I'm assuming most people in the functional and integrative space have heard something similar, but I'd love to hear from you, you know, the significance of each of these principles. Okay. Well, uh, the first, one of the first things that I realized when I started down this path, it was the importance of the individual characteristics of each patient. Patient. And that actually is a scientific approach to medicine. It is not non-scientific. During my years as a research scientist, when I was in my training, I realized that the fundamental principle that guides, that has to guide science is the, is that truth is in the details. And if you change one detail, you can change the outcome of an experiment. Well, when you're dealing with people, the details include who this person is, both in terms of their family background and genetics, but also all the things that have occurred to them during their life that brought them to this moment when you were sitting with them. And if you don't understand that, you can't really effectively treat the patient the way that I find it important to treat them. Now, you can get by. That is, if you have a basically healthy person who comes in with a sore throat, yeah, you can treat that. But, the, but I see patients who are chronically ill, have very complex cases, and you have to start with understanding who is this person. So often, sometimes people will want to jump into telling me about what's going on now. And I'll say, well, let's wait. We'll get to that. But let's start at the beginning. <laughs> like, you know, let's start with your childhood. And let's work up so that, I, so that I understand that when this happened to you, this is who you were mm -hmm. from the perspective that I can kind of put together mm -hmm. that's re medically relevant. And, and, it, and that is so helpful to being able to understand what the next step should be. I'm curious, when you do bring in a, a patient or you start you know, with a new client, Dr. Gallen, what does that intake process look like? Because like you're saying, you need that backstory. I imagine you spend a lot of time initially with them. Yeah. Well, I, I generally, I spend about an hour or a little bit more and I've gotten, uh, I've done this for so long that I can tend to focus in on the things that I think are important. And it's my asking questions, my getting a feeling for these are the questions that I need to ask. It is as much an art is a science, and the art comes in, in the experience of, of working with people. We can learn a lot just on what questions to ask, and I'm sure it's just innate in you now. Like you said, you kind of know where to go and navigate with each patient. Well, uh, not always, but <laughs> I def definitely have an idea of where I would like to go, or if with what, what the person is bringing to me is, is, has so many different aspects to it that I have to be able to sit back and, and figure out what's the, you know, what's the most important thing we need to deal with mm -hmm. and, and what comes after that. And so that intake initial interview process is definitely one of getting to know the person and also trying to establish for myself what I think are the priorities that, and, and then running them by the person because it, it's not my priorities that matter. It's the individual's. It's the yeah. patient's priorities. I agree. Uh, I'm always talking about the same thing, Dr. Gell. And just in terms of let's match our priorities with the patient because yeah. it's not about us. And I've heard you say the same thing. Yeah. Practitioners, we're not there to talk about what we think the diagnosis is and what our priorities are, but we have to meet the patient where they are. So I, I love that you promote that. And I think it's really important, especially with complex cases, we have to take it one step at a time and let them lead the way. I totally agree. 
So in your presentation for the Institute for Functional Medicine back in 2021, Dr. Gallen, you spoke about the missing curriculum. Now, I have them listed if you, if you want me to read them off, but I'd love to learn more about how you came up with this list and what inspired you to seek that out. Well, I, I was teaching and I decided that they're just truths about why people get sick that are not going to make it into a medical school for another generation or two. And I don't, I still think they haven't quite made it, but so I, I left teaching. I went into practice in a small town with a pretty stable population. And my idea was I want to understand like what's really going on with people. What, why are they getting sick? And what don't I know enough about to be able to help them stay, get really healthy and stay well. And, uh, and in the course of exploring that and reading and going to conferences, you know, I remember one that was, I don't know if I learned anything specific in it, but it was called Don't Let It Happen Again. <laughs> and it like opened up a whole perspective on ways of thinking. So I, I realized, and I don't know when this was, this, you know, in the late 1970s, I came up with this idea that what we're missing is I don't, or what I'm missing, I don't know enough about nutrition, about environmental health, and about behavioral medicine. And and I actually did a fellowship in behavioral medicine. I spent just thousands of hours studying nutrition, looking through textbooks. There was no internet in those days. So, you know, everything was on paper. And, uh, and, And what was amazing to me was how much was actually known that was clinically relevant, that mattered, and that nobody in conventional medicine was paying any attention to. And so I started to incorporate that into my approach to treating patients. And, uh, and you know, and the results were pretty astonishing. And, and I remember at one point, I had gone to work in New Haven with a colleague that I had a very good working relationship with, Sid Baker, a place called the Gazelle Institute, we saw a lot of people who had been evaluated at Yale, because that, of course, is the dominant, the gray eminence in town. Mm-hmm. And, and what I, I realized a couple of things. One was the more Yale specialists a person had seen without getting help, the more likely I would be able to figure out what needed to be done. Because <laughs> <laughs> they had already eliminated all of the, all of the conventional yeah. obvious things. <laughs> And, and that was a group particularly suited for what we were doing. And what it felt like was uh, I was going into the basement of a house and there were all these people trying to fix what was going on at, on the upper levels, but nobody was looking in the basement. Oh, I love and that. I was like going around with a lantern because it was very <laughs> dark there. And oh, here's this problem and here's that problem. And when you start addressing these things, there's so many things that begin to fall into place. If we just take the difference between nutrition and drugs. Almost all the drugs that are used in conventional medicine are basically like biological straitjackets. Mm-hmm. Their purpose is to downregulate or diminish or control some function in the body that has gotten out of control. But none of those functions exist for the purpose of going out of control and making you sick. They all exist to help you balance the way that you respond to different kinds of stress. So if the only tool you have is a straitjacket, you're going to get side effects that come out of, of the straitjacket effect. Mm-hmm. And, and that would happen over and over again with drugs. But if you start to approach things nutritionally, you can do multiple things at once. So if you put somebody on a drug for their ulcers, it may impair kidney function and may raise blood pressure or aggravate asthma. But if you can deal with their GI problems without the drug, then the nutritional factors that heal the GI problems actually will help their asthma and their high blood pressure. And and so that just became what seemed to me to... I mean, this just made the most sense as a way to try and help people. Sure. Now, one thing is initially we were doing a lot of work with nutrients that were given intravenously because people didn't seem to be re- responding to oral 
supplements very well. And that's when I started to get really interested in the gut. I mean, I don't know if you're ready for that yet, but what I realized is if you could clear up the problems that people had in the gut, then you didn't need the IV treatments. You, they could respond to oral treatments. And so I began to focus a lot of what I was doing on the first step is like, let's see what's going on with the GI tract and let's try to heal that. And I got to know, Dr. Gallen, I'd love to jump into the gut microbiome and we'll transition there in a moment. But before we move on, why do you think that nutrition is still grossly overlooked in medical curriculums, even today? Okay, it has to do, there are two factors in medicine that really keep it from advancing. One is the influence of the pharmaceutical companies. They, and I mean, I've dealt with a lot of them because in, in some of the research that I've done, I've had to interact with pharmaceutical companies. I was trying to get cooperation. Big Pharma is interested in one thing only, profit. I mean, I would, and I mean, I'll say that, but people I know who have a very conservative outlook who have dealt with Big Pharma, they'll say the same thing. They are not there to help people. That is not their goal. It is simply the bottom line and the shareholder. And so, I mean, that just creates a whole range of problems. And the other thing is the way that medical specialties are organized. You know, there are all these silos. And of course, within each, there are the power dynamics within each silo. I mean, that's the problem with all institutions is they're really more about power than accomplishment, which is unfortunate, but that's just the way things are. But within medicine, there are all these silos and, and specialties, and there are very few specialists who really think across the silos, who think in an integrative and comprehensive fashion. I mean, I remember about, you know, many d- decades ago, I saw a book on a shelf that said something like integrative physiology. And I thought, wow, that's pretty unique. <laughs> Let me see what that has to, what that has to offer. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'd be curious myself even today. So, okay. Thank you for diving into that. So let's transition. We know you've led the way in the study of the gut microbiome, Dr. Gallen, and its relationship to overall wellness and chronic disease. In fact, one of your publications titled Intestinal Protozoan Infection is a Common Unsuspected Cause of Chronic Illness was published in 1989. So just for listeners out there to put things into perspective, So how did this conversation surrounding intestinal permeability, also known as leaky gut, uh, come about? Well, it's just in in the course of, I got into a particular way of doing things a long time ago, which is to, to actually, to go into the scientific literature, to look at the basic research, to not accept anything that somebody was telling me as being true. And in part, it was because a lot of the stuff I'd learned in medical school and actually, this started there. You would read something in a textbook, and it would say there would be a statement. And then you go to the literature behind that statement, and you find that, well, it actually didn't say that. It actually showed something a little bit different, but that difference may have great significance. There's nuance there. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I just started reading the literature. If there was a problem that a patient had or an area that I wanted to learn more about, I would go and start reading about it Mm -hmm. and and trying to form my own, uh, my own opinions. And then I would look for people who had thought about this, who in that particular area, it it really made significant original contributions. I would try to get in touch with them. I'd try to understand if the way I was interpreting their work was the way, was consistent with the way they thought about it. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember exactly what, you know, exactly what the change was, but the paras- the work on parasites had something to do with it. I think the, the initial insights had to do with yeast, probably in the role of gut yeast in creating a whole range of systemic problems. And it then became pretty clear, well, it isn't only the yeast. I mean, they're opportunists, but there are these parasitic infections 
the and and in, in every case they may be good, they may be bad. That is, people have lived with intestinal parasites since the beginning of the human species. And there are certain parasites that actually help to balance the immune system, just as they're uh, the ones that concern me were the ones that were making people sick. But and, and so from there, those are the large organisms in the gut, the large microscopic organisms. It's just one step to start looking at uh, the bacteria. And they are so much more complex because there are uh, at least a thousand species in each individual and multiple strains within each species. And, and they have different effects. I mean, a di two different strains of the same species may have different effects in the gut. And whatever is happening in the gut will impact the rest of the body through a, a, a whole range of mechanisms mm. that I have described in some of my writing. Uh, about 10 years ago, I published a paper called The Gut Microbiome in the Brain. And I, I talked about the ways in which what's happening in your gut may affect your brain and vice versa. To get, and we're not going to go into this now because there's not enough data, but this is, but understanding the microbiome is a little bit like quantum physics meets rocket science because there's so many variables. The latest variable, and it's going to be important in the future, so I'm just putting it out there, are, is the role of viruses in the gut. Mm -hmm. There are about 30 times as many types of viruses or, or viral particles as there are bacteria. So we're already up at 100 trillion. We got yeah. many more of those. Most of them infect the bacteria and they either kill the bacteria or they alter their function. And these are called bacteriophages. And trying to integrate an understanding of the virome into the microbiome and that's going to take incredible computer resources to figure that out mm. but it will be important uh, definitely going ahead that will need to be taken into account sure and from a therapeutic standpoint that's the little bit i'm hearing about it is that correct possibly yeah 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 you there will be therapeutic approaches that impact the the bacteriophage population we already know we have some preliminary data. Uh, stevia, for example, a commonly used sweetener, which may have some benefits and may actually be anti-inflammatory, stimulates the activity of a lot of the, those bacteriophages. And we don't know which ones mm. is yet or what, what, the, what each one means. But that's a, you start eating a lot of stevia, it's going to have effects that you're not even aware of mm. through the bacteriophages in your gut. Oregano does the opposite. Oregano silences a lot of the bacteriophage viruses. So, but we don't know, is it, if you mix stevia and oregano, what happens? I mean, <laughs> you know, we're dealing, we're, we're dealing with a lot of wide open questions. Yeah. Brand new frontier. It's fascinating. Truly. Yeah. And I've heard you also mention, Dr. Gallen, the microbiome is the intermediary between lifestyle factors in the human body. Of course, we know this, but that was so well put. So I wanted to throw that out there and really ask, based on your experience, of course, individuals are going to be different, but generally, what do you find the most influential dietary lifestyle environmental triggers for leaky gut? I mean, what really stands out? Of course, we think alcohol and processed foods, but stress, despite maybe a poor diet, what have you seen after all these years? Sure. Well, so the, the factors that cause uh, leaky gut or an increase in intestinal permeability, just run through like the top ones that, that I've encountered. And now, but you have to understand, I'm seeing people who may be more like the people watching this podcast. They're very health conscious. Mm -hmm. They've been following healthy diets. Mm -hmm. So if you were to take the, like the general population in the U.S., it would be the Western diet, ultra-processed, high in unhealthy fats and in sugar. I mean, those are all things that in studies, laboratory studies have been shown to create leaky gut. It'll do it in mice and rats and people and just about any animal that you feed that way. The alcohol has a definite effect that's been proven to increase the leakiness of the gut and to alter the gut microbiome. 
the, the level at which this happens is going to vary from person to person, I would say. Drugs, especially the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or aspirin, uh, naproxen, those drugs have been shown to cause the le- to cause leaky gut. There may be some antibiotics that will do it as well. Next, moving over the next cause, a loss of healthy bacteria, loss of the beneficial bacteria that maintain this barrier and keep it strong. And, you know, bifidobacteria in particular are important for that. But, and, and that is due to a combination of diet, which, because the, the, what you eat definitely impacts who grows in your gut and what they do, mm-hmm. but also other lifestyle factors and are you eating organic food? Or are you eating food that's contaminated with antibiotics? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the use of and exposure to antibiotics and Roundup. Mm-hmm. You know, that alters the, I mean, food, uh, I mean, anything that's a non-organic food is likely to be, if it likely to be contaminated with it, that alters the aspects of the gut microbiome mm-hmm. in sometimes in ways that are really important. So, Toxic exposures of various types, they do it. Having an infection. I mean, when I started out, a lot of the people that I was seeing, well, he got, he first gotten a parasitic infection or some other infection that really messed up. And then that, that would mess up their gut bacteria, but then the treatment of it would further mess up the it's microbiome. No you know, yeah, you, yeah. In other words, you have to treat it. But when you start killing it, you then, there's collateral damage. And so yeah. all of that needs to be addressed. And, and then, and then there, and food allergies. Food allergies cause a leaky gut. And there was some ground, just amazing work that was done in France maybe 30 years ago with kids. They measured their intestinal permeability directly through a test. They then fed them different foods. When they ate the food they were allergic to, their intestinal permeability would go up. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and then of course there is the effect, the influence of stress and different kinds of stress on gut permeability. And that's been studied. And, and in some of the laboratory research, what's been interesting is the mechanisms by which stress impacts the gut microbiome uh, or leaky gut are different than what you might expect. They, because there are actually vagal mechanisms of, for creating leaky gut, like swimming in ice water stimulates the vagus nerve in animals anyway, and creates leaky gut through that mechanism. But then there are the effects of, gut, of stress on the microbiome. And, and this is some kind of fascinating research I discovered, yeah, maybe 10 or 11 years ago. We, we always would assume that if people got infections after a stressful event, it's because the stress was suppressing their immune system, Mm -hmm. which may occur. It turns out that there are certain organisms that thrive on adrenaline. E. coli loves adrenaline. Mm. So you get, you, you have, you're in this hyperadrenergic state and you're really stressed up, stressed out. The E. coli in your gut is really getting invigorated. And, uh, and then there's this, and, and in fact, it becomes more likely to produce toxins in response to the adrenaline that you're throwing at it. Now, there is then another phenomenon that occurs that I found to be really important, linking inflammation with what's called dysbiosis, the imbalances in the gut microbes, which then leads to the leaky gut. And it has to do with substances called nitrates and, and the origin of the nitrates, which is produced in your body a gas called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a very simple molecule, but it has tremendous regulatory activity in your body. It regulates your blood vessels and your circulation. It has impacts on your brain. It has in, many impacts on the immune system, both anti-inflammatory and in, and pro-inflammatory, immune stimulating. It, the balance of the way nitric oxide works in your body 
really is very important for understanding immune function, really important in the uh, in COVID-19, for mm -hmm. example. So there are, when you generate, when you have inflammation, you generate a lot of excess nitric oxide. That breaks down in the tissues into nitrates. Now, there are some bacteria that thrive in high nitrate environments. They're mostly the ones you don't want. And there are other bacteria, mostly the ones that you do want, that are killed off by nitrates. And if you dump high nitrate uh, detergents into the water supply, you're going to alter the microbiome of the water, water supply in ways that are undesirable. Mm -hmm. Well, when you have inflammation in your gut, you're essentially, you're doing the equivalent. You're not doing it, but that is what's happening. You're getting this high nitrate environment. E. coli and other inflammatory bacterial species love a high nitrate environment. And so they thrive and they create more inflammation and you get this vicious cycle. So you, that's why just you can't just take a simple probiotic and expect that you're going you're gonna to solve everything. You have to deal with the inflammation. You have to deal with the overgrown or, and undesirable organisms. And so you need to kind of know what they are. You can maybe figure out what they might be, but you have you need to be able to 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 analyze them so you know what the target the goals and targets are. Hmm. Yeah, I'm in all of the research that you do. I almost think you're more of a scientist and researcher than a provider. I hope you don't take that in a negative way. It's well, let me just say I, I try to bring. I try to bring the science to what I'm recommending to my patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of my patients are very health literate, literate mm -hmm. and they spent a long time finding me. And so they're, they, if, I don't, if I don't talk like this to them, they're going to be disappointed. <laughs> if I think that there are patients who are not ready for it, we just skip all of that. I can act like a more conventional physician. <laughs> this depends. Adapting yeah. to the patient, of course. Exactly. Like we, like you had already mentioned, meeting them where they're at. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I want to repeat something you've already said, Dr. Gallen, and that's that scientific truth lies in the details. So with that being said, we've talked a lot about, you know, the contributing factors. And I want to dive a little bit more into the research and the data piece. So tell us about how you use functional lab testing in your practice to find that truth. And I'm curious also what type of labs that you'd like to use most often. Well, I, I've been, in terms of the gut, being able to test the microbiome as thoroughly as possible is really important. Now, that can be very limited in terms of available lab tests. And it's also a science that's evolving mm -hmm. because there are more, what, what, what I want from a lab test looking at stool is I want to know for certain whether there are any path, potential pathogens identified. And often the most sensitive testing for that is DNA testing for those pathogens. And then I want to know about the balance of certain healthy bacteria. And, and uh, there are what are called keystone species. Keystone species are like holding the whole thing together. And... So I, I, I want to know that there are enough of the measurable keystone species because they don't not only impact what they do, but they impact all of the other organisms. And, and there are different clusters of these species that interact among one another, within, within the cluster and then with other clusters. So I look for that and try to make my own determination what's important here what can I do to facilitate a change in, in the direction that I'd like to go? It, it's not always clear cut. I mean, you have to really look at it in the context of this individual and not only their goals for themselves, but what are my, what are the steps that I see is happening mm -hmm. to allow them to accomplish those goals? So from that perspective, it's not as if there's anything that's, oh, this is good and this is bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are pathogens that we want to get rid of, but for the rest of the organisms, it's 
is, is, does this person need more of this? Or do they actually maybe need less or is it irrelevant? And that's a decision that I have to make for each of the clusters. Yeah, I would love to get more detail and find uh, ways of getting more support for that. But I mean, I work with what I can, with the information I can get. Yeah. How often are you repeating stool tests or assessing the microbiome, Dr. Galland? Oh, I do. I assess the microbiome really frequent, frequently with the patients that come to see me. But it's also, you know, I have a list of priorities. What, what is the top thing I have to look at in this case? And sometimes the microbiome is definitely where I want to start. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's down on the list because I've got to deal with more pressing issues. Right. But going forward long term, the health of the microbiome is always important. And you know, it's one thing, a couple of things to understand. 99% of the chemicals that circulate in your blood originate with your gut microbiome. Mm-hmm. I mean, you may, your organs may be altering them, but that's where they start. Mm-hmm. And there, in your body, you have about 30,000 genes. And so all of the things that make you a complex human being would need to be accomplished by those 30,000 genes. Now, a grain of rice has 50,000 genes. How did that happen? <laughs> well, the microbes in your body collectively have 4 million genes. And I think those numbers are enough to explain why we really are dependent upon them as a complement to whatever is, whatever is human in terms of DNA. Right. And there never was a time when humans existed without microbes in their body. <laughs> I mean, they were part of the evolutionary process. And, and there's some really interesting research in, in rats and mice, actually, that indicate that. And it's a little bit of a digression, but I found it pretty fascinating and, and really misinterpreted by the scientists. If you take germ, they have these germ-free animals that have probably no microbes in them. I don't know if they're really 100% germ-free, but they're close to it. <laughs> and they behave differently than the conventional uh, strains of those organisms. And they have this thing called an open field activity box in which the, you just see how, the, organi- how, how the, the, the rat or the mice walks around. Well, germ-free mice, um, they really explore the box. They actually act more like a conventional rat in that box. Whereas germ-free rats, they hold back. They're very timid, kind of like conventional mice are. So, and, and then if you take the microbiome from a particular strain and you put it into those, or you feed it, and it's easy to feed rats and mice because they are coprophagic. So you can feed the gut microbiome of another organism to it, rats especially, their behavior changes. So, and, and so what becomes clear when you look at this research is the characteristics that we attribute to mice and rats are not due to the mice and rats, it's due to the microbiome mm. of the of the mice and the rats. And if you take that away, the mice act more like rats and the rats act more like mice. <laughs> now, in the wild, that would be very dangerous because mice are, 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 are prey and rats are predators. Yeah. And so, you know, predator, predatory animals <laughs> and animals that are prey shouldn't be acting the same. They should yeah. be acting differently. So then I extend that. So, so what about humans? What's happened to our microbiomes? And what about human behavior? So there have been these studies done, which indicated that, you, of course, you can't get germ-free humans, but you can look at the impact of probiotics and antibiotics and changes in the gut microbiome or their metabolic activity on behavior. And there are influences of gut microbiome on criminal behavior, um, on a problem-solving behavior, on empathy. So, I mean, what? So, the future of our species is going to depend on empathy and problem-solving behavior. I mean, I agree. Without that, we are really. 
I mean, we are doomed. <laughs> and then you get, so then the criminal behavior takes over. And, so, uh, and so we need, so the gut microbiome will play a major role. It has in the past of the human species, will play a major role in the future of our species. Mm. And in fact, the closer we come to develop, to, to having our lives run by artificial intelligence, the more important the microbiome is going to be because the controls are going to have to come from us, from our ethics and compassion. And I mean, that's, you know, in our ability to think through difficult problems. Yeah. Gosh, it's wild. Yeah. Fascinating and timely in what's going on in the world right now. The microbiome is always timely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Always a, a good topic of conversation and ever evolving, obviously. So now I have to ask Dr. Gallon, what about digestion? I know personally so often I see low normal or clearly low pancreatic elastase on stool mm. tests personally. And I just, yep. I have to know kind of, you think about this top down approach oftentimes in functional medicine when it comes to digestion, but the influence between digestion and dysbiosis, can you speak to that a little bit and how do you address it? Okay. Yeah. I've observed that also, Emmy, that there are a lot of people who have, sometimes I'm surprised because they don't have the typical symptoms that you'd expect with pancreatic insufficiency. Right. The, if you are not able to digest your food, then that is going to change what's presented to the gut microbes, especially as you go further down the gut into the colon. And so there's that influence. But my theory about the people who don't really meet the criteria for, I mean, you wouldn't expect that they had pancreatic insufficiency, but their pancreatic enzymes are really low. Mm -hmm. I think there's probably, that's the effect of the bacteria breaking down the enzymes. Ah. We know that if you have a condition called uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, that the proteases produced by those bacteria can break down enzymes. Now, it may not matter if they break them down in the large bowel, but if they're breaking them down, they're breaking down your pancreatic enzymes in the small intestine, then you're going to get maldigestion and malabsorption. Mm -hmm. So when I see that, I try to figure out what what's happening with the proteases being produced by these microbes in the gut and is excessive activity of those or bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine impacting their health. Mm -hmm. So back to the know, microbiome, so, yeah. Yeah. My direction and, really. Right. It, it really is at, at every step. And the small and, and the bacterial overgrowth issue I mean, that doesn't only cause GI symptoms. It's best known for causing things like bloating and gas, mm -hmm. maybe diarrhea or constipation, although it can be a result of constipation. So we get back into this, you know, this bi-directional aspect. But there have been controlled studies of people with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, mm. separate studies. And if they have cyber and you treat the SIBO and clear it, their fibromyalgia improves, their chronic fatigue improves. Amazing. So there are these important systemic effects of bacterial overgrowth in the small bowel, above and beyond the GI effects. Hmm. My brain is in overload, right? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm perpetually in overload, so I have to find ways to organize it. Oh, man, it's so Definitely. fascinating, though. I, I do want to switch gears a little bit, Dr. Gallen, to more of your nutritional therapies. And I, I wanted to bring this up. I found this, again, it's just everything I'm learning about you is incredibly fascinating. But in 2019, you were asked to design a unique dietary supplement that didn't exist, but that you would like to see. And your answer to that was TLC, which is an extract of three functional food ingredients. I'd love for you to share with us, you know, about that supplement, its conception, you know, but more so, are you using that or how are you using it in the treatment or prevention of your patients? Oh, I, I use it a lot, actually. And the reason when, when this young man who, who had the company, uh, Lenovo, came to me and said, oh, I really like, you, you know, is, I'd like you to design something that you'd really like to see. So I thought about what, what is missing? Because there are so many good products out there, frankly. And the first thing 
that I thought about was black cumin seed. Black cumin seed is a health food throughout the Middle East, the Near East and the Middle East, as far as India, and maybe even into China. And it has been shown to have anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer properties and anti-allergic effects. The, the most active ingredient in it is something called thymoquinone, and that's the T in, in TLC. And so one of the things I wanted to be able to see was an extract of black cumin seed oil that had a fixed amount of thymoquinone in it. So I knew that this is going to be 5% thymoquinone. Yeah, it's going to have all the other ingredients in the whole food, but I want to make sure that there's enough of this thymoquinone. So that was the first thing. And then I thought, well, okay, what would I, what else would I like to see? And the second thing, the L stands for luteolin. Luteolin is a bioflavonoid. I've been interested in bioflavonoids for, I don't know, 35 years or so. And if uh, one summer, in fact, I just sat down with a series of textbooks, of summaries of a conference, international conferences on bioflavonoids. I said, I have to really understand these guys. I think they're very important. <laughs> and it was amazing. I mean, it was just mind boggling. So then, you know, having understood them, the best way for me to understand anything is to put a presentation together for somebody else. Yeah. So that's what I did. I, in order to understand that, I put presentation together on bioflavonoids and kept amending it. So luteolin is a unique bioflavonoid. It has anti, like thymoquinone, it has anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer effects, and anti-allergic effects. And there are several good luteolin products out there, but they're mostly, they're not exactly the way that I wanted them. So I thought, okay, we'll put luteolin in there. And, and curcumin has been a favorite of mine, as for a lot of people in mm -hmm. our field, you know, for decades. And I thought, well, curcumin, and so I looked at the interactions and I saw that curcumin actually enhanced the effects of thymoquinone. There was a really positive balance there. So that became the C. Then it was easy to call it TLC because <laughs> it was right there. And, uh, and I wanted it to be liposomal, so it would be very well absorbed. Mm. I use it for different purposes. It works the absolute best for allergies. Mm. And I mean, I've just had so many patients in, with allergies and hypersensitivities, which is about half my practice anyway, mm. but who found that it really helped uh, stabilize them. Uh, I think for natural products, there are two kinds of effects, which you usually don't see with drugs. There's a short-term effect and there's a long-term effect. Mm. So the short-term effect is, okay, this is what it's, it is often like a drug or pharmaceutical effect. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, this is controlling inflammation. This can reducing the effects of histamine. It's doing all of those things. But there is a long-term effect in that, especially with the, flavonoids and other polyphenols, they act as curators for the microbiome. It, it's the same way that fiber does. And in fact, if you really want to grow a microbiome that is most likely to be health promote, promoting mm -hmm. for people, you want a high fiber diet but you, and, you, and a low sugar diet, but you also want a high polyphenol diet mm -hmm. because yeah, the fiber is kind of like the food, but the, but the polyphenols are, are, they're like the sculptors. They're there. They're deciding they are helping certain specific organisms grow and changing their growth pattern and inhibiting others. So with things like TLC, you get a long-term effect that's, that is above and beyond the short-term effects. Mm. It may take three months, six months, a year before it becomes obvious. Mm. What a beautiful analogy. The sculptor, the polyphenols as the sculptor, I'm forever going to think about those bright polyphenols in my food mm -hmm. as really curating the microbiome. I yeah. That's fantastic. Your yeah, analogies are on point, Dr. Galland. <laughs> right. And if we take just a couple of, like one of the keystone species is Acromancia mucinephila. Okay. Sure. Now, there are certain polyphenols that enhance the growth of Acromancia. They're found especially in pomegranate and cranberry. So if you want to, and I put together a formula for something that I call an acromancy shake. 
which is based on that. You know, to give my patients if I want to simulate acromancia growth. That's uh, that's probably the one species in which the the strongest case for an acute treatment has been made. But we're going to find others. Yeah, we're talking a lot about acromancia, and so well, I got to know it's a smoothie. You said. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a smoothie with. Uh, I can send you. Just give me your email address. Oh yes, please. We can put it in the show notes. I was okay. going to say yeah. Sure. Love that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so that's probably one of them. But I have to know before we wrap things up, Doctor Galland. Most well-informed folks know about bone broth for its glutamine content to manage leaky mm-hmm. gut. But what are some other therapeutic whole foods that you like? Okay, therapeutic whole foods. Okay, well, first of all vegetables and the cellulose that's in the vegetable cell wall, really important. So I would say, you know, trying to get four or five servings of vegetables and then three or four servings of fruit every day. I think that really makes a difference. Some, and again, depending on your sensitivities, legumes Mm. can be an excellent source of soluble fibers and really help with gut function. But then they're kind of challenging because of the potential for excess fermentation. So that's where individual balance comes in. There's not one diet for everybody, just as there's not one probiotic for everybody. Of course, yeah. And fermented foods too. You know, that's a nice therapeutic food in place of probiotics, depending on the scenario. I'd like to throw that out there. Right. If, if there, so if you have someone who has a yeast allergy or is a histamine intolerant, they may have problems with the fermented foods. Of course. For everybody else, they're likely to be very good. And they actually have been shown to stimulate immune function. And they stimulate a type of T lymphocyte that is important for protection against viral infections and cancer. And so I will use them, recommend them a lot to people recovering from COVID-19 or battling cancer. Ah, a great point there. Really good application. Thank you for that. All right. And I'm sure there's a little tie in there to allergies. I know the allergy solution, one of your, your books, I'm sure you talk a lot about the gut microbiome in there. Am I correct? I, I'm going to read it, but oh, I just want to know. Oh, yeah. The gut <laughs> micro, yeah. The gut microbiome has a definite impact on the risk of allergy, but it goes beyond the gut microbiome. It's also the nasal microbiome and the oral microbiome. And there are organisms that, okay, here's just an example of the way things tie together. There are certain strains of staph that love to grow in the presence of some of the natural, uh, not of some of the synthetic antimicrobials that are used in soap Mm. and in personal care products. So you start treating yourself with these you're going to get an overgrowth of certain strains of staph. Mm. Now, those strains, of, some of them will produce what are called super antigens. They may make them in your sinuses, but you're going to swallow them. They'll get down to your gut. The effect of super antigens is to shift your immune system in a way that increases inflammation and allergy and decreases the, the corrective responses to it. Are there ways that you can control the growth of these aside from avoiding all those products? Yeah, there may be resveratrol, for example, which is available as a supplement. It's found in a Japanese herb, herb, uh, in Japanese knotweed, and in red wine. Although you need a lot of red wine to get the amount of resveratrol (laughs) you probably need. So that's not the way that I'm recommending people do it. (laughs) But that uh, resveratrol and curcumin, they inhibit the growth of these particular types of, of staph and also their production of, this, of the super antigen. So there are ways, if you know that this is, or suspect this is a problem, there are ways to correct that. I, I love that you're giving a solution to these modern day inflammatory triggers that so often we can't avoid. The synthetic personal care products, as you mentioned, how can we combat that and really find balance So especially if we're doing the best we can, I think people can drive themselves crazy when they're trying to avoid all of these toxins. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can't, I mean, it's, I I have a chapter in the the allergy solution 
that was actually written by my son. And it's, I think it's the best chapter in the book, frankly. It's a very, it's really thorough analysis of the effects of the chemical environment on the development of allergy. And I mean, it's insidious and it's universal. And yes, part, so part of what we need to do is to find ways to compensate for that. And, and by the way, getting back to the gut microbiome, there's emerging research of the impact of environmental toxins on the gut microbiome, mm -hmm. uh, beyond Roundup, you know, you know, a lot of different things yeah. that impact the way the immune system works in the gut, the way bacteria grow. I mean, we are ecosystems and we're intimately connected to all the other ecosystems around us. Yeah. Uh, and, and the next advance in medicine is going to have to come out of understanding that. Yeah. And such a great point to leave off on because this is ever evolving, as I said before, and it's almost inevitable that these things are impacting everybody and everybody's becoming a little bit more aware. I think everybody's waking up to these, these triggers. So thank you so much, Dr. Galland. You've shared so much with us. Thank you for sharing your unparalleled wisdom and expertise for our listeners today. We touched on the roots of functional medicine, the profound <laughs> impact the gut microbiome has on overall health, the practical steps to support this system naturally. It's truly been a privilege and, and really a pleasure. Before we say goodbye, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you on a personal level. So just three rapid fire questions, if you'd be so kind. What do you think? Well, let's see what they are. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. I'm going to take the first one. If you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? To live forever. <laughs> oh, I love I, that. I, 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 I mean, I'm, I, I love being here so much. Uh, that, nice. Yeah, that, that I haven't nearly run out of things I want to do. And just keep learning <laughs> and learning and learning and seeing learning, you learning what happens and learning, as yeah. time goes on. Yeah, yeah. that resonates. I love, I love that answer. Thank you. Second question, Dr. Gallon. If you could go back in time and tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? Follow what your passions are. I mean, it's pretty much what I wound up doing. Yeah. There, but let me just say, professionally, there is some advice that I just want to put out there, if there are professionals listening. When you're a novice and you're starting out, go with what works. Things that seem to work and they're, and they're making a difference and they excite you, go with that. Once you become experienced and a seasoned practitioner, flip it around. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to your failures. What, who are the people you weren't able to help? Because that's the only way you're really going to raise the bar. You can't just keep going back over, oh, this worked and this worked and this worked. It's Where wasn't I able to make a difference? How can I grow to be able to make that difference? It's really profound. Thank you for sharing that. I don't think I've ever heard anybody mention that. So I love that. Yeah. Do what you're well, passionate actually, you know, about. I could, that is part of sports psychology. That's yeah. where I that's where I learned Sport. that. <laughs> Novice athletes do best with positive reinforcement, but seasoned athletes do much better with negative reinforcement. Okay. Hey, buddy, you shouldn't. Have, hey, you did that wrong. You swung yeah. that bat wrong. You know, it's because they have that confidence. We got to kind of bring yes, them back down. Right. The earth Once a you've bit. gotten the con <laughs> right, absolutely. I love it. it there. <laughs> Last question, and we'll send you off. Uh, and for lack of a better word, what is a guilty pleasure of yours, Dr. Gallen? Oh, there are, I happen to love food. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there one so, in particular that you maybe yeah, wouldn't know? Yeah, chocolate. chocolate. Yeah, chocolate. Okay. Everyone says chocolate, but if it's dark, <laughs> okay, you know. Yeah. Let's go with that. Perfect. That's it. Well, thanks for being a great sport. And thank you again just for being here, your expertise, your knowledge, sharing that with us and the listeners. Let our listeners know where they can find you, Dr. Gallen. Well, I have a website, drgallen.com. I have a lot of information on that website. And but there's a document posted there called Long COVID Prevention and Treatment. It's about 50 pages long at this point. I put it up there. I mean, it it's, I've had different versions of it since the beginning of the pandemic, but it's up there to help people navigate through this minefield yeah. of uh, COVID-19. I've already Thank downloaded you. mine. Thank you for that. <laughs> Great resource. All right. And with that, we will say thank you everyone for listening. Until next time, stay vibrant. 
Thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so we can continue to pay it forward together. And remember, the key to longevity is knowledge. Keep learning, growing, and tuning in to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast to discover the latest insights and strategies for optimal health. Join us again next week. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational and informational purposes and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The views expressed by guests and hosts are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy of Vibrant Wellness. As always, consult your healthcare provider before applying any recommendations that you heard here today.